Welcome. My name is Tracy Cook, and this is a podcast series, Victim to Victory. This series gives a voice to those that have overcome obstacles in all forms that dare greatly to share their real stories. Amazing humans like our upcoming guests that have seen hope and risen above those adversities to become victorious, that now go on to support, empower, and inspire others to do the same. So please subscribe, like, share, and comment and check out our Launch Brand and Market podcast course in the show notes. Today, we have got a powerful guest. She is absolutely amazing. Please connect with her. She has a powerful story and she's the author of Balancing Act, Writing Through a Bipolar Life and it's a mental health advocate, a public speaker, and a former psychotherapist who lives with bipolar disorder. Now, both her personal experience and clinical background inform her advocacy and enable her both to help herself and guide others towards mental health recovery. I'm very excited for this interview. Kid O'Malley, welcome to Victim to Victory. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. It's wonderful. Thank you, Tracy, for having me. It is our absolute pleasure. We love talking about mental health and and hearing stories, um, especially like yours, Kit, that are just so relatable. And we all know somebody with some kind of um, mental health um, and, and needing recovery and hearing those real stories of connection so that we can have the tools and resources to be able to help a friend in need or to help ourselves as well. So Kit, where does your story start? Well, actually, my story starts when I was an 18-year-old college student. I became uh, severely depressed and suicidal when I was 18, and I thought the world would be better off without me. My family would be better off without me. It was just, I, I wouldn't wish those thoughts or that depression on anyone, and they're very common thoughts, <laughs> the, the people who have severe depression, which is amazing that the same thoughts occur to people. Um, and um, luckily, I sought help. I told my friends about the thoughts and um, and uh, and all and they, you know, encouraged me to get help. And um, at one point in time, I got to the point where I actually had um, not just the thoughts, but a suicide note and the means, like I got a bunch of pills gathered together and I had a time that I was going to do it, all these things. And um, and at that point, um, I knew it was very, very serious. I understood that it was very serious. And I went and I called a friend and asked her if she'd stay with me until I saw a therapist. And I went to my um, dormitory resident assistant, who's the, the uh, grad student they have with the undergraduates to kind of be there. Uh, leader. And I said, would you please get me in to see somebody really good today? Because I'm suicidal. Um, and, you know, if I hadn't have asked for help, if I wouldn't, you know, I might not be here today. So it's really important that if you are struggling, that you ask for help. Um, because there is help. Help is out there. And, and, um, and that's, that's, what kept me here today is that I went and I got um, what was what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, where the therapist helped me take those thoughts that were um, very negative and rewrite them, which is interesting because I'm a writer. So you take and you write down, you know, the world would be better off without me. Well, no, that's not true. And then you, so you write down what's true. And so you, you literally retrain your brain to, and you, you change those pathways um, so that, and it's a skill that I've had, I have still to, to today that where you can stop yourself, you know, I've learned how to stop myself and say, nope, that's not true. But it it always wasn't always. So I lived with depression or the diagnosis of depression from the time I was 18. I could go on forever because my I have a lifelong <laughs> story. So you could tell me to stop at any time. We can change it. Fine. But so I went from the time I was 18 until I was 30. Um, 
just with psychotherapy to cope with a diagnosis of depression. And I had, um, within that time, you know, I, 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 I uh, you know, I graduated from undergraduate school um, and um, from UC Berkeley. Um, I started off at UCLA, which I don't know if you know in Australia. Those are probably, you probably know who the, those schools are even mm-hmm. in Australia. I mean, I know University of Melbourne and stuff like that. So, um, and then, um, and then I went to graduate school and uh, became a psychotherapist. And I still was going to therapy, you know, sometimes three times a week. <laughs> so, I mean, I went, I, I was very committed to being well. And, um, and as a therapist, I actually worked with um, severely emotionally disturbed adolescents in residential treatment. And that's um, a pretty difficult to do. Those kids have it, have had tough lives and are living with very serious mental illnesses. Um, and and finally, at the time I was 30, I became so depressed, not just because of the stress of my work, but I also, I had switched from working with girls to boys and one of the boys, actually, I don't, I didn't put this in the story you've, that's out there, but one of the boys attempted to rape me during a session. And, um, you know, I tried to go for the phone. He disconnected the phone. I, luckily, I was very good at kind of, um, in, in, for U.S. football, you, you in flag football, you rush the quarterback and pull their flag. So I was very good at rushing the quarterback, at kind of going back and forth and weaving and getting through the, the line that's protecting the quarterback. So that's what I was able to do was kind of go b- b- back and forth and get past him. Um, and I got out and I, I, you know, they got some help from some st- strong men <laughs> because this, this kid was six mm. feet tall. A 16 year old boy is, um, pretty, pretty big. And so I had that happen. And around the same time, my grandmother died and a friend from high school died of AIDS. And I was living in the, the San Francisco Bay area. So I had a lot of friends who had AIDS and it was very, it was very hard because that was before we had all the promising and helpful medications that are keeping people alive. Back then people were dying. Um, And, um, and so it got to the point where after the attempted rape, where I couldn't even get out of bed and I called up, uh, that was my depression. My depression was so severe that I could not get up out of bed. And so I called my parents and I said, I can't get out of bed. And um, they said, okay, please go to your doctor. You need, let's, you need to try medication if it's that bad that you can't get out of bed. And so I went and I got medication and I started with my intern, like my regular doctor, you know, not a psychiatrist. And, um, and I tried one medication and it, you know, I had a, I, I was an SSRI, which is Prozac, was at the beginning of the, you know, it was back in, in 1990, maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like, I don't know. It was in the early 90s. So, uh, and uh, and I started to have a reaction to it. So she gave me another medication to kind of calm down the reaction to it. And because of that, my parents said, why don't you get a second opinion? You know, go to a psychiatrist. And so I went to a psychiatrist. And unfortunately, the psychiatrist took me off those medications because he didn't believe in SSRIs. And he put me on a different medication, which is a tricyclic. And the tricyclic, and 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 and, and actually any antidepressant can do this, especially for somebody who has a predisposition for bipolar disorder, which I just hadn't been diagnosed with. Um I, after he gave me that medication, I experienced a week long uh, period of mania. I was psychotic and I was thinking simultaneously, I was thinking um, in zeros and ones and that's binary code. I didn't understand it, but I understood that it was binary code. And I was thinking about Christian mystic saints and that was something I was familiar with, I had an interest in. And I was thinking about chaos theory, which is like mathematics and physics. 
Um, so I was definitely above my pay grade. <laughs> the thoughts that were streaming through my head and they were streaming through so quickly that I could not comprehend them. Um, and so what happened and it was a week I couldn't sleep because it wasn't a name. I couldn't sleep with these rushing thoughts. Um, so a friend of mine who knew what was going on called my priest and called my father. And she told both of them, Kit needs you now. Mm. She's she's in trouble and I can't help her. She needs you now. And the priest came right over and he brought a seminarian who had bipolar disorder. And he was had me call my psychiatrist and the psychiatrist, you know, prescribed medication that just put the thoughts, stopped them right away because it gave me some antipsychotics, which stopped them right away. I didn't stay on those forever, but it just stopped the mania. So I had a three-day three day course of antipsychotics. And uh, my dad came down, and my sister came over, and they just nursed me back to health. I ended up actually moving back in with my parents. Mm. Uh, and that is when I met my husband. <laughs> I mean, the journey just so far, Kit, I mean, you know, going through all of that depression and the suicidal thoughts and actually having the awareness in those deepest, darkest moments of depression to still reach out and and ask for help uh, because, you know, that could have, um, you know, taken a turn for the worst at that point. And then to be able to battle for, for, for that long with depression and then still pull yourself out of that to go and, and study to be a psychotherapist therapist and then to be put into the situation of an attempted rape um you know these are things that you keep thinking were you thinking kind of why are these obstacles still keep appearing um I'm trying to do my best why are all these things keep um presenting themselves for me and what were your what were your feelings around that time that time as well when you're going through all of those battles and then you you're moved back in with your parents was the depression still there or was it kind of like a roller coaster all along and and did you have those suicidal thoughts again um well at i i had had suicidal thoughts uh, coming up to that point and 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 even later in my life at times, but not as chronically or severely um, as I did when I was 18. Um, the depression when I was 30 was almost more of a physical depression than a suicidal depression. It was, uh, see, there's so many different symptoms and so many different ways that depression can present itself. I didn't want to end my life when I was 30, but I could but the fatigue of the depression was so great that I wasn't able to move. I mean, I would have died if I hadn't have called my parents because I wouldn't have fed myself. Yeah. I wouldn't have gotten, you know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have taken care of myself. I wasn't able to, I was like a baby. You know, I mean, I, I, if you can't get out of bed, I mean, I, obviously I did get out of bed. My, my parents said, go to the doctor. And I, I, I did, I fought, you know, I was always good at doing what I was told to do. Okay. That's a good idea. I'll do it. I'll go to the doctor, <laughs> get a second opinion. Okay. I'll get a second opinion. But still the feeling was, my experience was of this overwhelming physical exhaustion. Mm, yeah and I think that's that's just so relatable for people who have, who have suffered that that chronic depression as well and it just consumes your body where you're you're confined almost aren't you you're confined yes. with your abilities and your friendships and your relationships and um you know or, all of that and and out of this you've you've still managed to get yourself that second opinion you you've moved back in with your parents um at this time were you were you married uh, or you you've only just met your husband well this is what's interesting is okay so right after that mania i was still 
you know, I was, I had my, my parents helping me out, but I was not yet living with them. You know, we were, I was trying to make it on my own. So there was this period of time, several months when I was trying to pull myself up by my bootstraps, right. And, and get on a different medication, you know, and, and, and go back to work as a temp, right. Because I, not as a therapist, I wasn't able to do that. Um, and my sister brought a date over and we went out to eat and he said he had four brothers. And I said, four brothers. Are you kidding? Hey, hook me up. Give me, give, give them my phone number. <laughs> and so when I did end up moving in with my parents a few months later, a couple of months, like right about that time, I ended up realizing my parents and I realized, okay, I'm not able to do this. I kept on trying to pull myself up and I was falling asleep driving. You know, mm. I mean, I, when I was in the temporary job, it was just a, a, a temporary easy job and I couldn't read. Here I was somebody with a master's degree and somebody who had been a, like an honor student at UCLA and, a, you know, I, I graduated from UC Berkeley and I went to grad school. This grad school wasn't as fancy it was new college of california but but still i was pretty well educated and i i uh i couldn't read a, a sentence my brain was so broken at that point that the words would fly apart i couldn't hold the words together long enough to 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 form to to read them um i could go and do database work because for some reason that was like a different part of my brain but if i tried to do anything involving reading or writing i couldn't do it mm. and i was so afraid i'm like can other people like they didn't they couldn't necessarily see what was going on but i was like how can i do this i'm not able to do this job because i can't read and write and um and so finally, you know, I just, in, in, in talking with my parents, I said, I can't drive. I'm falling asleep. I can't read and write. And they were with me, actually. They actually were staying with me where I w was or, or, you know, in a hotel or whatever. I don't think, I don't remember exactly where they were sleeping. Oh, no, I guess I had a futon. We were sleeping in the same place. <laughs> so, <laughs> then they were, they were, finally, they're like, okay, you, why don't you, would you, you know, move back with us and, and you know, see we'll just, we'll just start, we'll, just take, we'll see how it goes. So I moved back in with them. I started by doing stuff around the house, you know, painting rooms, painting furniture, you know, outdoor, you know, all uh, painting. They didn't. And then as I started getting better, then they started charging me rent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I they didn't have enough projects for me to pay the rent. And so as so as I got better, they started charging, you know, like, okay, now it's rent and board, you know, I'm like, okay, no, no rent and board, I'll do I'll pay, I'll make my own food and buy my own food, and I'll pay you rent. And and but I could not make enough to pay them off. So doing little odd jobs around the house. So I went and got a temporary job, and ended up um, having a 10 year career in commercial real estate started out as a file clerk and 10 years later I was an investment analyst. <laughs> so... <laughs> a lot of career progression there, a lot of career progression, but <laughs> did that restore kind of your, um, your, your mental health in a way as well and give you kind of a little bit of purpose to throw yourself into kind of something that was progressing your career and something that you didn't actually typically study for as well, just taking that new path? It was it was, it was, it's interesting because if I, if I pull back from exactly your, your question, yes, it did. It gave me purpose. It gave me, first of all, it gave me something that I could build on, right? Because I started as a file clerk. So all I really need to know is A through Z. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but I'm more intelligent than that. And my intelligence was starting to work because I was on better medication because I saw a, a, a doctor and where my parents lived in Southern California that was better and worked in collaboration with the psych with a social worker they were in the same office so I had to, I'm a big believer in team at having team working together and so I had they, they were communicating with each other which was great so I was as my brain was getting fixed um I was able to um uh think more clearly and solve problems 
And so as I saw things that I was filing, I was seeing problems with the things that they were just filing. I'm like, you know, this bill hasn't been paid or this bill you've been paying and it's not, you shouldn't have been paying. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not for you. It's for, you know, it's, yeah. and so I was found problems and, and was, would you like me to take care of this for you? Yes. <laughs> so I was just, so I was, I ended up being, you know, helping the property manager so much about like, this commercial real uh, building, um, you know, high rise building that I ended up becoming her secretary um, and doing a lot of her job for her helping her. And then I just, it just built from there, you know, position after position, working up within that company and then another company, you know, and so, so on and so forth. So yes, but what's interesting is that when my parents were elderly and I was much older, recent in the you know, last, uh, before they died, I drew upon all of my career experiences so that what may not have made sense at the time like why do I have these disparate careers why am I first this legal assistant and then I crash and burn because I'm overworking so much and then I become a psychotherapist and then I crash and burn and then I become a computer science I mean a, 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 a working real estate well I had to deal with all these issues I had to deal with legal issues when my parents both of them had dementia I had to deal with legal issues I had to deal with psychological behavioral issues because of their dementia and the behavior that brain damage causes behavioral changes and I had to deal with real estate issues because we had their house that had to be sold and I remember being in phone calls with my sister conference calls and my sister was like wow you understand the vocabulary of everybody we talk to because of these disparate careers and I'm like wow God had put me on this path that I did not understand at the time but everything had a purpose in my life so mm. yeah I love amazing. how it kind of, it, it does all, it's like this massive ball of, of um, string. And as we peel away the layers, they're all still connected in some way, aren't they? And I yes. love that your lived experience was all for a reason. It all comes together at some point and, and at some point we just trust that process. And now that you're a, a mental health um, recovery advocate and you're a public speaker and with all those lived experiences with being a psychotherapist and in real estate and dealing with the affairs of your parents and things like that and also living with bipolar um, yourself and going through the the numerous medications, all these lived experiences uh, kit that you have in your back pocket in your toolkit is only going to help others in those type of situations. So if you're listening to Kit's story today, please reach out to her, share your experience. I'm sure she's very open to helping you with your recovery as well. And Kit, what kind of message would you like to leave the audience on today? Well, I actually have a wonderful takeaway that I wrote. <laughs> so this is going to be a little writerly. I am not weak. Oh, and as I read this, these first first through first few sentences, I, I think everyone listening should think in first person. As I say it, think it. I am not weak. I am vulnerable. I am not perfect and flawless. I am loved, lovable, and loving. My life has meaning. My life experience gives me purpose in helping others. Now, I personally am grateful, and I thank you, that I can write and I can speak as I'm doing now, to share my journey with others, hoping that it inspires others to accept themselves. Wow, that's, that's very my powerful. Away. The I am statements, so powerful. Thank <laughs> you so much for sharing that. It's um, uh, it's really, 
a message that will, is going to unlock someone's prison or potential and hearing those words today, hearing your lived experience and the journey that you've been on and how it all is there for a reason to overcome those obstacles to be the visionary of tomorrow. Kit, I really thank you. You're so appreciated and thank you for being brave to share your story um, in all its vulnerability as well because it just helps so many. You can find the Victim to Victory podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple. And if you got value from today, which I know you did, reach out to Kit, connect with her and please subscribe and comment. And don't forget to have a look at the launch brand and podcast course in the show notes. And let me leave you with a message of wear your story like a superhero cape and not an anchor. Kit, thank you very much for your um, interview today. Thank you. Thank you. See you on the next episode. Thank you.